grab some water actually. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, I wanna welcome you to tonight's living room lecture. Um, we have Modern Representations of Archeology span and Media, the Roman City of Jarosh, Jordan by Chris Boyd. My name is Stephanie Sandoval and I'm the Deputy Director at the San Diego Archeological Center. If you would like to know about our center and our preservation efforts of local archeological collections, please visit our website at sandiegoarchaeology.org. Um, and there you'll find more information on planning your visit, membership options, and our upcoming events. Tonight, we will be using the Q&A feature, and you can find that on your Zoom control panel. So feel free to enter questions, type them in at any time throughout Chris's presentation, and then we will do a moderated Q&A at the end. So feel free to use that at any time. Also, after tonight's um, presentation, when everything is over and ended, you will find a link on your browser to a very short survey. It is only three questions, yes and no, and it's just helping us gauge your interest in continuing these online virtual programs into the fall um, and whether or not you would be willing to attend an in-person event. So I promise it will only take you a few seconds, but please, um, it would be great to have your feedback so we can better um, plan the next uh, year or so. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce a San Diego native, Chris Boyd. He brings a very unique perspective tonight as a writer and documentary filmmaker um, to our living room lecture series. He studied writing for screen and television at USC and later went to complete his master's in archaeology at Durham uh, University in the UK. He has worked all over the world on TV shows and feature films, written screenplays for many of the major studios like Warner Brothers and Sony and produced multiple short film, um, short form documentaries. Chris's debut feature documentary, The First Padres, won a Pacific Southwest Emmy Award and was acquired by PBS along with his next feature documentary, Black Speech. Right now you can find, um, he was a screenwriter on HBO Charm City's Kings, nothing to do with archeology, span but make sure you check that out. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thanks everyone for joining tonight um, and the center for, for having me. Uh, my first time doing a, a Zoom presentation um, like this, so hopefully no technical issues, but I think we're all used to that by now after a year. Um, I sound okay, everything's good? Great. Um, so, uh, Thanks, Stephanie, very much for the, the introduction. I'm, I'm here to talk about a project. I was an archaeological project that I was involved in um, and present or show you a lot of, or not, not too many, um, several videos uh, that came out of this project. Um, and hopefully it'll give you a, it's kind of a, a, a basic understanding of, of how modern media can be used in um, within archaeology, which is a, a big interest of mine. So what I'm going to be, the, the site I'll be talking about tonight is called the Second Century Temple of Artemis at Jerash and Jerash, Jordan. So some basics about the project. Um, and I should mention that my, my, my hope with this talk is just to provide some 
some ideas and some food for thought about how someone with a different background such as mine can add a whole different kinds of elements to archeological projects um, such as this one. Uh, some basics about the project. Um, it's been ongoing since 2018 and will continue on until next year, maybe beyond depending on what happens. There's um, obviously a lot of slowdown uh, due to the pandemic. My involvement in the field was back in late 2019 in October and November. So all the material that you'll be seeing tonight was uh, collected back then when I was actually in Jerosh. Um, the, the project is based in Jerosh, Jordan, which is a city in the north. And I'll, get, I'll show you a, a little bit about where it is in case you're not familiar, which I was not before I went there. Um, Jerosh is a uh, now a modern city, but it's had a history as a Roman city, the late Roman period, the Islamic period, the Ottoman Empire period, um, and now it's a modern city uh, in the what's Jordan, what we call Jordan, but the full name Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, which is um, the country of Jordan. Uh, this site has been excavated for many decades, so this is by, by no means a new place, it's, a, it's a, a tourist attraction and it's been available to the public for a long time. It's just a little hard to get to. Um, so to situate you in where this is that we're talking about, uh, here is a map of the Middle East and here's Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, border. Um, and the occupied territories of Palestine here. And Josh is located in the north. It's to the north of Amman. So here's a, a detail of that area. Here's Josh in the upper corner here. I have a little arrow to help out. Um, here's Amman, uh, the Dead Sea right here. And here's Palestine. It gives you an idea um, you know, right in the, the heart of the Middle East. And modern day Jordan, um, if, if you haven't been there, it's, it was my first time going there and I was able to learn quite a lot, but it's, uh, it's, it's known for having a really high number of refugees actually. Uh, refugees come from Syria, Iraq and Palestine mainly. So there are many, many refugee uh, groups, um, entire what they call camps, but are really small cities that are entire populations of refugees who actually have no citizenship within Jordan. So there's a lot of populations that um, are in limbo um, in this country. And Jerosh is no different. Uh, Jerosh has a huge Palestinian refugee uh, population, uh, of which I, I worked with quite a few people from. So um, it's, it's quite an interesting makeup. And Jordan as a country is, is heavily reliant on USAID. So there's a, a long history of American involvement there, which, which comes into play in the archeological project that I was a part of. Uh, here's a satellite view of, of Jerosh. Uh, population is about 50,000. You can see in the middle here, this is the archeological site where I was working. And see, it's just, the modern city just surrounds this place. It's almost like a central park, um, a central park filled with Roman ruins. So it's kind of an interesting central park. And uh, to orient you, there's Amman about 35 miles to the south. And here's what the modern city looks like. give you an idea of kind of how close the the ruins are to the city and then you can see in the lower right corner there um kind of a typical middle eastern city with those white stone facades and um kind of large what we would call plaza areas uh very common in a lot of cities in the middle east and around jordan and then you have these amazing ruins right in the middle of the city. So this is the, the Hippodrome where there were chariot races 
um, some of the temple columns, one of the, the more famous amphitheaters there. And it gives you an idea of what these ruins look like. And you'll have a chance to see some, uh, some more of it in the, uh, the videos I'll be presenting tonight. Um, Jerash as a, a Roman city was uh, built in the second century, mostly during the, the time of the rule of Hadrian. So um, this is this archway that I'm circling here is what's known as Hadrian's Arch. And so the project that I was involved in, here's kind of our title card, um, which gives an idea of, of the people who are behind it. Uh, the project's called the Conservation in the Second Century Temple of Artemis, the official designation for the archaeological project that's going on, of which I was only one component. And you can see backed by the U.S. Embassy in Jordan and the Ambassador's Fund, which I'll get into the details of that. So the temple in question here um, is the Temple of Artemis, as I mentioned, from the second century, uh, around 150 CE, uh, the temple itself, which was just after the rule of Hadrian. Um, it's, it was built uh, as, as a, a place for the, the worship of um, the goddess, uh, which is associated with Artemis, Artemis in the Greek and Roman pantheon. And it's, it went through a lot of different uses over the years, um, but now it stands as this kind of a unique example of Roman architecture at that period of time, um, specifically the, the capitals that you see at the top, uh, the really highly decorated, um, exquisitely carved capitals at the top there. And here's just a few different views of how the temple looks today. So the conservation project itself, um, it had some very specific aims. Um, and those, those aims were to prevent the collapse and the destruction of the temple, which is a major attraction and it's a key monument at this site. So as a conservation and restoration project, um, the, it had a few different aims, but on the conservation side, the goal is to conserve the original element. So the original um, stone carving structures, anything that, that was excavated um, and that is original that, that can be preserved, that is a, a key a key goal of the project. And then on the other on the other side there's the restoration and that's to restore the structural integrity of the temple itself um, by introducing new elements. So you'll see some of that in action tonight. But um, this is a, a common practice, in, especially when dealing with um, Roman, uh, Roman sites where the architecture could be crumbling and, and there's a real need to bring in architects and, and artisans and people to you know, introduce new elements and keep it from collapsing. Ironically, it's because um, archaeologists excavate these structures that they're then exposed to the elements and, and can then be at risk of collapse. That is what has happened at the Temple of Artemis, um, especially the flooding and the rainy season uh, over the years that it's been exposed to the elements is, is come at, it's come into a, kind of a great risk of collapsing as you'll hear them, some of the, the key people talk about tonight. Um, the, the project leader is Massimo Brizzi. He's an Italian archeologist uh, based in Rome and his company uh, is Monumenta Orientalia, which is an archeology span company that he runs in Rome. And he goes around, right now he's in Turkey, but um, he goes around working at uh, Roman sites. His company, uh, his company name is kind of a, a, a pun. Um, Oriente is the, the word for East in Italian, and then Italia is the word for Italy in Italian. So combined is kind of a, Italy in the East um, is, is kind of what he's getting at. He does a lot of work in the Middle East and, and uh, like I said, Turkey currently, usually in these types of big um, projects which are meant to rescue something that could be at, at great risk of being lost. And the funding for our project came from uh, you, us, uh, the US State Department, um, all of us, the taxpayers, 
And the specific funding body is, is the Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation. So the embassy in Jordan is, is really like who uh, the project answers to. And that's who um, Massimo Brizzi applied to originally. So here's Massimo and uh, the logo for his company. And you'll see him quite a bit tonight because he is a key figure in a lot of the, the video work I did. So um, I'll get into, why, uh, into how I became a part of this project, but I thought it would be um, good to start, start off with uh, one of the short videos that did come out of this project, but it's, it also is the history of excavation work at um, Jerash itself. So it'll kind of give a short overview of uh, how um, this project fits into the, the kind of history of excavations that have gone on there. So um, I'll go ahead and, and play this video now. And then I'll uh, talk about it a bit more afterwards. The city as, as first was identified as Geraza by this German traveler archaeologist. He started the period of the collection of the documentation of what was visible without excavation. There was a phase that started at the beginning of the 20th century, again with a German scholar called Schumacher. He realized the first topographical map, and the first excavation happened soon after. Before, it was a part of the Ottoman Empire. After the First World War, this was part of the mandate of the British government. During the British mandate, this organization changed and it was the phase in which a Palestinian department was founded. The British government organized a first department of antiquities under the direction of a scholar called Oswald. From 1929 until 1934, every year there were archaeological expeditions and the result of this archaeological expedition are till today the cornerstones of our knowledge. Most of the works were uh, focused to allow the visiting of the city. So there were many excavations using the army, the soldiers as manpower. So it was a massive work with very few, very bad documentation, unfortunately. Many columns were rebuilt to create the astonishing column street that is visible today. An Italian archaeological mission was started in 1978 to study the architecture of the sanctuary of Artemis. Soon after, the Jordanian department organized an international mission where the Italian joined together with a French mission, a British mission, a Spanish one, a Polish one. So five, six missions all together. This was, let's say, the golden age of archaeological research because so much has done and so much has moved on in the knowledge of all the historical phases of the city, not only in the Roman world, but also the earlier one and 
mostly the Byzantine and the early Islamic period uh, uh, of the city. So hopefully that gives you a, a bit of an overview of, um, of Jerash, the place. So there's the excavation, or not, sorry, not the excavation, the conservation and, and restoration aspect of the project going on. And then coupled with that is what's called public archeology, span um, which is also a really big part of this project and also uh, where I come in as a, a filmmaker. Um, public archaeology is a concept that, or a, a, an idea that's, that's gained a lot of popularity in Europe, especially in the UK. And the, the kind of overall um, concept is that the better we can understand the public's perception of an archaeological resource, the more, the more that we'll be able to engage the local communities in raising awareness of that resource and then invest those same communities in the sustainable site management. So the ultimate goal is site management, but it begins um, on the ground by engaging with the public in really meaningful ways to discuss archeological material that might be within their community and they have no idea or they have an idea, but they don't understand it or um, you know, some combination of those things. Oftentimes in archeology, span um, there are projects going on in places and the public is completely in the dark about uh, what it is and, and, and why it's happening. Um, here in California, you know, we have oftentimes really good reasons for that. And um, in other places, there's, you know, there's different histories when it comes to archeology, span but in, uh, Europe, uh, especially, there, there's just been historically a, a failure to really um, educate the, the general public about why things are happening. And uh, one of the, the things that public archaeology is responding to is this kind of legacy of colonialism that's existed in, um, in archaeology for, you know, since its, since its founding or since its beginning. Um, especially, you know, imagine a place like Jerash and you just, you just heard uh, Dr. Britsi talk about the different missions which came into Jerash. You know, just all these European countries came into Jerash and landed and uh, began to, um, to dig. And, and with good reason, they were the only, you know, trained archaeologists and Jordan is, is lacking in trained archaeologists. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but one of the reasons for that is that there is a kind of a, a lack of a lack of understanding from, from the beginning, you know, starting from when students are, are very young. Um, you know, archaeology is not like a path that's a, a very common thing um, in Jordan. It's growing, but it's, it's growing through efforts um, like this project to, to help educate people. So public archaeology um, is a big thing we'll be talking about tonight. And it's intended to work hand in hand with the scientific research that's going on. So this is the first project actually that um, Dr. Britsi even worked on that has the component of public archeology. span He's only ever worked on, on projects that are just straight research, just collecting, just collecting data. Um, and that wasn't the case here. There's, there's, there was a big focus on outreach. So what that looked like specifically in Jerash. Um, so Jerash is, is a place where at the local schools, they teach students very little about the site. So it, it's hard for us to imagine here, but when you're, when you're there, I mean, it's, it's you know, you're, you can be sitting at the, the school and look literally across the street and see, you know, a 2000 year old Roman monument that's completely foreign to us here, but that's their everyday life there. And um, then it might sound a little strange to imagine that you know, in, the, in the local public schools, there's very little even taught about, about the site and what it is. And coupled with that, um, a lot of the tourist money that, that goes into the site doesn't flow to the local community as effectively as it could. Um, oftentimes, 
these are these are just uh, tourists landing from Amman. They get on the bus. Uh, the tour operator in Amman collects all the money from them, gives a little bit to some key figures in Jarosh, but it, it, the, the people show up at the site, get off the bus, uh, walk around the archaeological site, get back on the bus and leave. They don't spend time in the local community either. There is uh, one small hotel in, in Jarosh that has, I think, six rooms maybe. Um, and there's, there's one restaurant that is kind of welcoming to, to foreigners and it's very close to the site. So it's not a place that has a lot of infrastructure to, to even benefit from this tremendous resource that's right in the midst of the, of the people there. And as a result of many years of, um, di for different reasons, uh, locals oftentimes in talking with them as I did a lot, you know, they perceive the, the site to be not not a part of our heritage um, is, is kind of the, the quote I used to sum up that idea. But um, it's not only that this was a place that was Roman because it was it's all, it also went through many different phases. It's that the site itself is, is seen or is felt to be something that is really difficult to be understood. And so um, the idea with the public archeology span side of this project is to start to try to chip away at that wall and try to open up some more dialogue with the local people with the ultimate goal of you know, one day, the only people taking care of the site and, and, and really benefiting from it will be the local Jordanians, Jordanian government, the city of Jerash, the people of Jerash. So the, the goals to come out of the public archeology span side of this project um, were initially to conduct a visitor study, which went on in, in 2018 and into 2019, but um, that study was started by uh, Massimo Brizzi's team in Italy, uh, coming to Jairosh, conducting tons of on the ground interviews, uh, finding out where people, which countries people come from, um, what they do at the site, what their interaction with the site was, if they were a visitor, how they find out about it, if they're a local, when's the first time they, they went there, have they ever been on the site? It's amazing how many locals have never actually even been onto the actual archeological site, which is probably like us, you know, you meet Southern Californians who have never been to Disneyland. It, it could be something like that, but it seems a little bit um, sillier that it's not Disneyland. It's a, you know, a, a 2000 year old Roman site. So I think everyone listening now would think it's crazy not to go visit it. Um, but a big part of this, this, outreach was to conduct this visitor study and gather as much data as possible about who's using the site and how. And then along with that, which is where I came in, was also to conduct a number of video interviews with different people, stakeholders, people who go to the site and, and archive those. And then to compile and publish all this data. So that, that's the first stage of public archaeology with the goals of the project later on in the next year or two, also to hopefully get into the schools, um, start some educational programs, and um, see if there's other ways to start engaging the community. Also by presenting them with some of this um, video material, which um, there hasn't been a lot made about Jerosh over the years. So. All this being said, that brings me to the, uh, the big question you might have, which is why me and why I was involved in this project. So I'll play a, a short video, which might look familiar to some of you watching um, if you're here in San Diego. I think Blacks is our last great beach experience in the city of San Diego. We heard about Blacks Beach and that it was a nude beach and we wanted to go check it out. It's starkly beautiful in a natural way. There's no place on the earth like that. You're back in time, back before people started building in California. And it is for everybody. The only real local of blacks is God and the dolphins. So that was the, that was the promo of a documentary film I made, um, which is on PBS. And uh, if I'm known at all in San Diego, it would be um, as a documentarian who's made some films about our city. Uh, these two posters I'm showing you here, one is for that film uh, about Black Speech and the other is called The First Padres, which is uh, a feature documentary about the first uh, professional baseball team here in San Diego. So 
these were two uh, feature films that I made um, prior to uh, many years prior to me going out to Jerosh. So I have a background as a filmmaker. Um, I, as Stephanie said, I went to, to USC uh, to study film. I've worked in feature films. I've worked on documentaries. I produced commercials. I've made uh, commercial pieces for nonprofit groups. So I've worked in a lot of different aspects of filmmaking as a producer, as a director, an editor. I have camera experience. I, my first job was as a sound man. I've done everything there is on, on the film set. So I know a lot about the, the actual process of film production. And I went to graduate school in the UK at Durham University where I studied archeology. span So these were the two um, key aspects of my background that made me attracted to this, this project. And the third one was that I had a knowledge of Italian and um, although Arabic would be mo the most useful in this case, Italian was probably the second most useful language to know because of all the, the people involved coming from Rome and um, the long history of Italians working in this uh, particular place. So those, these three aspects um, are kind of the key components of my background that made me attracted to the project, the people when they were putting it together. Um, my interests, in, in archaeology and, and documentary filmmaking. Um, I was, before I studied archaeology, I was, I was, I became really interested in archaeological representations in modern media. I was, I was never as interested in the, in the kind of science or, or history side of things. Um, I came to archaeology really from the, the humanity side of things. And um, specifically, I, I became really interested in the, the impact on people who live next to ruins and with among ruins. I became really interested in how artists um, render archeology, span how they have over the years. I um, did my thesis when I was in, um, when I was studying for my master's in archeology span in the UK, I did my thesis on how Roman ruins are used and how they influence the work of Fellini. And here's a few examples of the work of Fellini Roman aqueducts in La Vita, the Baths of Caracalla in the same film. Um, in Satyricon, he imagined different ruins which were not real. In Roma, he actually made a, uh, a model version of the Colosseum and used it as if it was the real one. So I, I found this topic and, and just kind of ran with it and became really interested in how um, artists were interpreting archeological material, especially people who had lived next to it, um, unlike you know, Americans who did not live, who, who have never lived next to this type of thing. So, Jerosh became really kind of a perfect place to think about these types of things because as you saw, it's a city that's layered on top of different cities. So there is no one city of Jerosh. There's no one um, period which is shown to the public. You're, when you're looking at it, you're actually looking at many different um, centuries stacked on top of each other. So any interpretation of it or any experience with it is not a straight historical experience. It's really a, a, a modern social experience that you're having when you're there. So it's really kind of a perfect place for me to go and explore some of these ideas. So as a documentary filmmaker, the, the project was able to attach me to their grant application um, for funding purposes with the, the idea being that I would complete the video interview components of the public archeology span and make their online archive for them. And also I would complete a short video series on different topics, some of which um, you already saw in the first one, the history of excavations there, uh, something about their actual restoration project, a piece on a, fa a famous church building on the site, which has um, amazing mosaics, the different religions over the years in Jerosh and community engagement at the site. These were the topics that, that we chose for me to explore um, with the material that I gathered while I was there. So archaeological representations over the years, you know, uh, as I said, Jordan's pretty unique. You know, there are refugees living there um, from war zones all around, and they're living adjacent to Roman ruins. They may have never seen them in their life, um, and now they're living next to them. You know, when I say there's a, the, the Palestinian camp next to the, the ruins, you know, that's a permanent city now. So, you know, those those people are not leaving anytime soon. And so this, this type of thing has a lot of implications, um, not for the knowledge of the history of the site, but how the local government might manage the resources used to conserve the site or present the site to the public. So understanding how people are living with these ruins um, 
is what became really interesting to me here. And when we think about archaeological representations over the years, um, you have here an imaginary archaeologist. He probably looks pretty famous or pretty well known to most of you. And there's the real archaeologist, Zai Hawass, um, very well known in, in, as an Egyptologist and a strikingly similar look to our imaginary archaeologist. Um, the Indiana Jones myth has been really big in the history of archaeological representation. You know, how many people have you met as archaeologists now who, you know, when you say you work in archaeology, you say Indiana Jones, you know, it's, it's, it's such, a, such a big myth that, that, that what archaeologists do is have these kind of adventures and that's perpetuated by, um, you know, popular media. Um, it's also dominated by the kind of one hour TV documentary, if you imagine anything on, on National Geographic or Discovery Channel, you know, how many pieces have you heard of or seen over the years? It's like Secrets of King Tut's Tomb or, you know, um, the, the dark history of such and such. They're usually very recreation heavy and, um, and not as focused on the, the, the modern social aspects of things. So one idea with my part of the project here was to how could we um, bring in the social and humanitarian side of things a little bit more and how is that something that you know could have implications for the future because I saw this, the space for improvement very specifically in the short form documentary space like what you just watched and also the social media based content which as anyone who's ever been on social media knows is more and more video dependent. Um, and so video really is a perfect tool um, for those platforms. But we're seeing, you know, all the time different uses of media in archaeology. Uh, recently, just in April, back in Cairo, there was, you know, this, this procession, I'm sure many of you saw this, this procession of mummies that was right down the, the, the center of Cairo. Um, this was a made-for-TV spectacle by the government. You know, we know now that, that the poor neighborhoods adjacent to this path were blocked by the government so they couldn't be seen on television because this entire event of transporting mummies from the old um, Cairo Museum to the new site was intended to promote archaeological tourism in, in Egypt, which is a, you know, obviously a, a huge foundation of their economy. So you know, we see all the time different approaches to things. And when you look at a picture like this, there's, there's nothing that an archaeologist would point to at, in this picture that says this, this is a, a, a good representation of the history of Egypt. But there's a lot you could say that would say this is a good representation of promoting tourism or other things in Egypt. So these are the kind of things that I think are important to think about at this point. Um, some of the challenges of actually shooting this material, I've included a picture of myself here. This is uh, what you would call the set uh, that I was shooting on in Jarosh. You can see that it's me sitting on a dolly platform. Um, a few of the challenges that I encountered, the bureaucracy of Jordan is incredibly frustrating. Um, it's, and I was with a group of Italians and even they said it was, it's like nothing you've ever seen and they're right. You know, at one point we were waiting more than six weeks for, for the government to approve the one crane in the country to even be brought to Jerosh where it was gonna be moving stones into the temple that you see here. Um, so, you know, those types of things are incredibly difficult to navigate. Um, at one point, the, the GIS uh, equipment was stopped at customs and flown back to Italy and they wouldn't allow it in the country. So there's a lot of, a lot of problems um, for archaeology and filmmaking there. Um, and then on the actual film side, you know, this incredibly limited budget means I have an incredibly limited crew. That's the crew. It's pretty much just me. There's there's one other guy you'll see in a second, but pretty much just me. And um, you need you know this flexibility to pull off a project like this. We say in movies, you know, everything is either money or time, right? Like every industry. And in this case, we had no money. I was able to give about almost two months of time in the location to do you know every job on the production. Um, but that type of flexibility might not be possible. So that could be a challenge for anyone trying to recreate this type of of work. Some ideas of what the place was like, you know, this, when I, when I mentioned the limited crew, this was kind of what the crew looked like uh, when I would have one helper. Uh, this is our living quarters. Here's a drone which was broken when it hit a stone and you, know, you get an idea of the remote location. Um, I'll show you, this is pretty much the most elaborate 
day of shooting that I had on this production. And uh, this is kind of a classic dolly shot, but uh, anyone who's ever made a film would laugh at how small this is. <laughs> I still laugh when I see it actually. Um, but that was kind of like what a big production was like. And that was me finding the dolly in Amman and, and renting it and putting it up um, with a guy who has never done this before, but I taught him how to do it on that day. And, and we got some dolly shots. So we were able to raise the production value quite a bit. So what came out of all this on the public archeology span side was um, a couple of dozen community interviews which are now archived online for the project. And various people um, that I sat down and interviewed and then just post their raw interviews um, on, on the website of the project. And there'll be an archive um, you know, forever that people can, can check out as a snapshot of, of what the interactions with the site were like at this time. And I'll play just a couple minutes of one, give you an idea of uh, what these are like. classes it's outside um, we bring our own food we we uh, especially on the road we do all these singing activities and uh, have fun together it was all about building the connection among the students so as you can see it's kind of a, a very raw type of um, interview very anthropological in its approach and that's the idea with the community interviews just to capture um, with a series of questions people's thoughts about different things. You see someone who works at the site, a government official, this woman in the upper left corner is an Australian archeologist who worked at the site, specifically in the Hippodrome. So lots of different people. Uh, and then one of the kind of big, bigger video pieces um, that I put together from this project is about the temple restoration itself. So I'll go ahead and play that for you, which will give you um, some more feel about what the actual project is like. And um, and hopefully at this point um, you can you can kind of keep in mind that the idea of this type of video is to give an introduction to the place, but also uh, talk a little bit about the public side of things and, and why it's important. So I'll go ahead and, and play it. And this is um, another video in the, the the short video series that I'm still in the midst of creating for the project. تعتبر من المعابد يعني يعني العظيمه في بالنسبه للامبراطوريه الرومانيه يعني طريقه الاعمده والتاجيات وال يعني كانت مميزه والاجزاء اللي مجزئه المدرج كامل متكامل يعني لل The temple of Artemis I love it it's in my heart and I meet many people you know it many tourists coming here from America from Italian, from Spanish, from Poln, so I meet everybody. I love to work with Jarash. The project of Artemis is a very important project. An example of great architecture of the 2nd century AD because of the interpretation of urban visualization. I could say that it's a unique example. Gerasa was a crossroad, a crossroad of people, of cultures, of religion, of languages. This complexity is expressed in the materials, in the building of the temple itself. احنا يعتبر في الاردن يعني من اهم المواقع الاثريه او يسمى المقصد الثاني للزوار سواء من داخل الاردن ومن خارج الاردن بعد مدينه البتراء الاثريه.
we are trying to stop uh, some very dangerous situations, the vaults of the podium where we are, the western wall of the cellar and uh, the architraves of the doors of the corner staircase. These are the spots in the temple uh, of Artemis where it could be collapsed in any moment. Queste tre gallerie, nel corso dei secoli, hanno iniziato a, ad avere dei problemi. Abbiamo focalizzato quelli che sono i punti più critici di queste volte, che hanno comunque un, una funzione strutturale per il tempio, e lì abbiamo proprio deciso di cambiare fisicamente le pietre. Even not a very strong uh, earthquake could really affect the structure. Could happen nothing for uh, decades, uh, could happen tomorrow. La grossa difficoltà è che è tutto enorme. Ogni singolo elemento che presenta dei problemi è complicato da muovere, è complicato da sostituire. Come seconda cosa ha tantissimi piccoli problemi sparsi. Non sai quale curare per prima quasi. Tu devi curare ogni singola parte una per una. It's a kind of first aid if you want to compare our work with a medical intervention. We are keeping the temple alive, we are mitigating many critical situations. In secondo luogo ci siamo focalizzati su quello che era il manto di copertura di queste tre volte. Non essendo realmente un pavimento, un piano di calpestio, non sono adatte a stare all'esterno, cioè quindi a subire tutti quelli che sono la pioggia, il freddo, il sole. Per cui Un'altra fase di lavoro è quella di ricoprire queste pietre delle volte. The resources of the project are enough to save the temple today, but of course we can't operate here forever. So we are training a Jordanian team. This team will look after the temple. They will carry out the daily checkups, they will do the necessary intervention to keep the temple, the monument in good conditions. This is a good project and a good and I hope to be like this project in all the places inside the city of So that's uh, obviously you know, an overview of the, the temple project itself, um, second in the, the video, the short video series. So some of the outcomes from this, um, uh, you know, today's online media landscape, um, something we discussed a lot before the project and what, what they asked me to, to comment on quite a bit, um, you know, video is just so critical. It's, it's really everything in the online media world at this point, and specifically this style that you just saw, you know, text heavy, um, uh, something that, that can, can go to many different countries a lot more easily, uh, something that's, that's short and digestible, uh, and something that can be in, in a series. That's really the, the in vogue style, um, but not just the in vogue style, it's something that's been developed in the online media landscape um, because it's effective and uh, specifically as an introductory tool. You know, video is, is often a place where students or other people who are learning about something, you know, they go to YouTube, they see what they can find about it. And that's definitely been the case since we started this project um, in Jerosh. Video obviously has this dynamic, you know, this ability to present dynamic information in public settings like the one that we're talking in now, um, and also to support project archives, uh, like we're doing with the public archaeology side of this project. So it, it creates kind of a, a, a video document, if, if you will, that people can go back to again and again. And of course, like, like video and film always has, um, it allows people who will never see a place like this to experience some aspects of it and learn about it and learn about what's around it and the people who are working with it. And uh, I think most importantly at this stage, it's really big for securing grant funding uh, as we saw in this project. So. Um, you know, I've already been asked next year to work on a similar project, this one in Libya and Tunisia. Uh, in Libya, specifically a project that's dealing with um, a war zone where bullets have destroyed ancient monuments, right? And that's, you know, this aspect of archaeology that 
maybe it's so it is not what you would consider the traditional scientific historical side of things but it's this amazingly important social side of things to explore and, and something really interesting so i hopefully i'll get to go out and, and do a project there as well but i'm hoping to do more of these projects over the years for sure um recently i talked with massimo and uh, i just have a couple minutes of remarks from him but uh, he described a little bit of how he hopes, um, how his, his hopes for video, you know, really changed after working with me in the field. He had never worked with a videographer, a documentarian. The most he'd ever worked with was um, a professional photographer. He did a lot of work in Pompeii early in his career. So uh, even a place like Pompeii didn't have, you know, constant documentaries being made about it. Um, there have been many made over the years, but not specifically around a lot of the big projects that he was on. Um, he talks a little bit about here about the impact of media, and I'll play that for you now. The part of a documentation, filming documentation, um, film documentation of an interview uh, became something more. So a media, a mean to, to of public archaeology, so to disseminate actually uh, the ideas, uh, not only what we are doing to explain, that is also very important. Uh, in a way, more efficient than, you know, take some people and explain that you are cutting a stones in this way. <laughs> if you tell this is very boring, if you show the crane <laughs> bringing the, the, the big stones and putting and the people working and cleaning, of course, uh, this is the way to, to, to communicate something in a um, more effective way. No? We started as a documentation of, of ethnographic archive. We moved to something uh, with more dissemination and we are going to something else, <laughs> that is uh, university students. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the today university students, uh, they are using the same um, videos and uh, YouTube uh, uh, together with books, I, I hope. But I mean, the first approach, it would be this one. So if you, if we can, leave on, on on the web some important messages concerning you know conservation the problem of conservation about the the the, the site itself the, the the history of Gerash as we already did and most of the time is a matter of, of it's economic matter i mean is if you have the money you, you bring a staff of specialized people doing uh, so a photographer uh, once in the mission there was always a photographer doing the photos of excavation of the concert of the work of conservation recently is the the, the the photographer in a mission is rarer and rarer i mean a photo made by a professional is a photo where you see everything. I mean, within the frame of the photo, you can see everything. You can understand everything. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, Massimo, I think gets he's he's become more and more excited at, at, since um, I left Jordan. As he's seen more and more material come out, um, he's just been happier and happier. I think, and he really wants to try to bring this approach to everything that he's doing in the future. Uh, but as you said, it's usually a matter of funding. But he's seen more and more of his funding applications that um, they're asking for media components and you know being able to provide the right type of person onto a project like that is is can be challenging but um, the results he's seen are, are really helpful and, and amazing to his work so um, I'll, I'll wrap it up here with one last clip and um, you know just thinking in the future where I'm trying to go with some of this work um, thinking on a more abstract, uh, a more abstract level, you know, I think there are other things that can be done with, with media, um, with art intersecting with archaeology. I'm currently trying to take the material that I, I captured in Jordan and pitch this project to outlets for um, a larger film. I don't mean a feature film, I mean a, a short film. 
Um, but with a maybe a more abstract approach, maybe a different approach, maybe a way that's thinking about the archaeology as it's experienced rather than it's purely historical value. Um, so I'll, I'll show you a, a, a short, what I call a sizzle reel here, which presents a lot of this material in a completely different way. And um, it's the kind of thing that I hope will spark some conversations with people that try to take this project and material elsewhere. And um, I'll play this and then I think it'll be time for questions. Everything is interesting because of its relationships. The temple is very interesting in the sanctuary, the sanctuary in the city, the city in the region is like a Russian doll. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allah. The need to preserve the heritage is something that we have to do for the territory itself, not because this belongs to some people, but to the history of the territory. <laughs> The first excavation here uh, started more than one century ago. We are aware that excavation is destructive. Most of the damage has been done by the archaeologists right? digging inside the cellar. It's not a problem of water, in this case it's a problem of humans. Jordan is a not rich country. Of course, the problem of heritage must be solved in collaboration with the other country, richer than Jordan. <laughs> I have the feel sometimes that it's too difficult and to find the courage to continue sometimes is hard. It's giving us a city that's never existed. It's a city that is a mixture of seven centuries of histories all together. You have this feeling that you are just one of the many of the chain, and you are not the last one. So that wraps up my um, talk for tonight, and I'm happy to have some questions. Thanks to everyone for listening so far. Thank you so much, Chris. My name is Dante Ferenga and I'm the Development and Marketing Director at the San Diego Archaeological Center. I'll be moderating the Q&A portion of tonight's discussion. Just as a reminder, you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom control panel, and we will try to answer as many of those questions as possible. I believe we have a few questions already. Uh, someone would like to know, is this your first documentary on archaeology? Um, yes, this is my first documentary specifically about an archaeological project. Um, 
the the, the short promo you saw for Black's Beach, that my piece the, that I made about Black's Beach, actually, I, I that was in a, what you might call an oral history of the place. And one of the people I got to interview for that project was um, a local archaeologist who I'm sure a lot of you probably even know, Clint Linton, but um, that was my the first time I interviewed an archaeologist for a film. This was my first time about one project, yeah. And I believe you touched on this a little bit, but where did you stay during your time um, when you were filming this? Yeah, uh, we stayed. So over all the years of archaeologists coming to this site, they they built kind of a not trailer park, but um, they're they're permanent structures. But they're like these kind of trailers that were put together. And it, it went, as you saw in that opening video, the the golden age of archaeology. At one point, there were like five or six different countries with missions all living together and working all day. And from the description at that time, it was just kind of amazing camaraderie of all these people. By the time we got there, or the time I got there, um, and Massimo Brizzi, who's been going there on and off for 30 years, you know, he says it's just really deteriorated, but pretty much like a, a mobile trailer with a cot in it was kind of where I lived for a couple of months. And is this a UNESCO site? Um, I'm trying to remember if it, if it was designated UNESCO. I have to look that up. I don't want to speak out of turn. Yeah. And I is your I think Petra is. I don't think I don't think it, you know, so Petra really dominates the conversation in Jordan. You know, Petra is is everything in Jordan. So um Jarosh doesn't even hope to come close to that. <laughs> well, maybe with documentaries and more projects on it, it will get there. <laughs> is your is your film being used in Jordan for educational purposes? Yeah, that's the idea is that the series will be. Um I didn't include it, but Dr. Brizzi talked a little bit about how, uh, so actually in Jordan, foreigners are not allowed to teach in public schools. So it's an ongoing conversation with the government to hopefully even have the chance for someone like a Dr. Brizzi to go into a classroom and talk about what he's, the, the work he's doing right next to, to um, the community. But the hope is that, and I know it's our, the work has already been disseminated amongst a lot of Jordanians, just kind of on a grassroots level of us and all the Jordanian friends I made while I was there, you know, getting getting it out there and YouTube is, is hugely popular, um, but there's not an official program yet. Hopefully that will come in the future. Right. Um, and someone brought up how, um, of course, you talked about how the archaeological excavation hastens the destabilization of the temple structure. And someone, and then they also mentioned about the conflict between preservation and tourism economy. So while Jordan and projects related to the temple may rely on the financial gains in touring the site, every footstep and breath is more wear and tear on the site. Has there been any particularly unique measures been taken to mitigate the effects of exposure to the public? And is there some sort of ideal balance between preservation and continued access to the site? Um, well, the second part of that is definitely a much bigger question than I'm qualified to you know, pass a judgment on. I have my own feelings about it. Um, there, there aren't a lot of, there's not anything specific at this site that's different from, you know, the pyramids or any, any other site that you see in the Middle East. Um, it's, you know, they, they are uh, protected by the government. There is work going on to make sure that they're able to be accessed safely. Um, there's, you know, there's a big effort to bring in these types of archaeological projects, which are specifically designed to preserve them. Um, but the re I think the reality of archaeology, the, 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 the fundamental truth of archaeology is that it, it is a destructive act. You know, unearthing anything that's preserved underground, it, it has the potential to be destructive. So the question is, is there a benefit to you know, our society now to experiencing it, to understanding it? Um, and I think that Jarosh kind of is a, is a really interesting place to look at those questions because, um, you know, some of the Jordanians I talked to who were there who were in their 50s and 60s, they used to call the archaeology, they used to call the Roman site, which, you know, because it wasn't really fully unearthed until about 30 years ago. It was slowly unearthed over about 100 years, but and they used to call it the trash dump. It was just, you know, that would, oh, there were some columns, like the, the columns you see now at the capitals, those were just six inches above the ground, you know, 30 years ago. That was all buried. So um, is it better now that it's exposed? 
and we're losing it? Or is it better that it was buried and used as a trash dump before? You know, I think those are some big questions that we have for any major site. Personally, having um, experienced it and seen it, there are efforts to preserve it. I, I think that we all benefit from being able to, to see it. And we all benefit when the local population benefits economically from something which historically they have not benefited from, and which we've seen, you know, Egypt, of course, is the big example of that, but how how many millions of dollars it could have gone to help countries have, have not gone to those people. Is there any interest from local people to be involved in this project? Yeah, definitely. Um, you saw a couple of um, locals speaking in the second longer video there. Um, you know, those, those two uh, archaeologists were trained by um, a program that Dr. Breedsey was affiliated with at one point. There is now an archaeological program in, in the university in Jordan. So there is definitely an effort um, to get more people trained. And there is an interest by locals, definitely. You know, they just want the understanding of it, really, is, is what it came down to in all my conversations with people there. And we have a few students listening to this lecture from uh, Point Lummer Nazarene University here. And what would you say to history students about your own perspective or appreciation of history and preserving history after your experience working and trying to preserve an archaeological site? Um, geez, that's a pretty open-ended. Uh, what would I say? <laughs> Just my own perspective. Um, I mean, I think it's you know, I think it's more important after I think you know my time being in a place like this. I have always had a big interest in history and. Um, archaeology and uh, you know the humanities um, history of art I've always had a, a real interest in it and I think working in places like this it only enhances your your kind of love and appreciation for it and, and feeling that it's important you know I, it's so much better to be at these places and experiencing it than just you know than just learning about it if you can if you have the opportunity to go what were some special memories or experiences you had while doing the filming in Jordan um, you know, working with the, the local people was amazing. You know, so you saw that video of um, that young man pushing me on a dolly. Like, it's it's like that was a that was a crazy experience. Uh, I was I was there. They had no expectation of me doing anything. You know, they they the people who brought me in are like they thought I would essentially shoot iPhone videos. You know, and I I immediately was like, no, there. I know there are people who make films in Jordan. Actually, the Hollywood has made films in, in Jordan for a while. A lot of stuff that you see that is, you know, the Middle East is, is shot there. Um, but on the independent side, you know, I started calling, I started calling people. I, I met some people at this event I went to. It was put on by the the, um, the ambassador's office. I met a guy who worked in some film. I, when I make a call, he says, I know a guy with a warehouse with an old dolly. I go in, there's, there's this warehouse of German film equipment from the 60s sitting in there, like in a, in someone's, not even a warehouse, someone's apartment in the middle of the mall. It was crazy. Pull that dolly out, he rents it to me for like $5 for the week, pull it out, haul it back to Jerosh. And then I get, you know, this this kid really from um, the Palestinian refugee camp and uh, who was born there. He's never been to Palestine and has a tremendous um, interest in filmmaking. I said, do you want to learn how to be a dolly grip? And he said, okay. And uh, I taught him how to put the tracks down. You know, but that was one of the, that was one of the satisfying things of, of you know, all my kind of disparate knowledge of, uh, of filmmaking came to good use there because I know how to put a dollar together. I know how to even it out. I know how to, you know, do all those moves and, and being able to pull all that off and get some of those shots, which had really high production value. That was, it was super satisfying. But beyond that, it's just such a welcoming country. I mean, it's a, uh, Jarosh is an incredibly conservative city, religiously conservative, incredibly conservative. And that was at first something that, you know, I've been other places in the Middle East, but not as conservative as this. And it's gotten more conservative over the last couple of decades, everyone's told me, who was, who's been there a lot. And so at first I, you know, it was, I didn't know how, what it would be like. Um, you know, I wanted to go, I like to jog in the morning. I wanted to go out and jog and, Dr. Breezy said, we have to go buy you long pants because you can't wear shorts in this in the city. You know, it's that kind of a place. And like, that was at first like, whoa, what's this going to be like? But then to, to make some friends, to get involved with some people, to get invited into homes, it just became this really amazing experience and getting to understand like, hey, this isn't just 
it's not just columns, you know, it's not just columns and blocks. It's like, this is, this is people's lives from every day that they're experiencing. It's really, really cool. All right. And following on that, what was the biggest challenge you encountered? Um, you know, it, it's, it's also, it's the flip side of that probably. It's, um, you know, living in a place that's that foreign while you're trying to do work is, you know, I've, I've worked in other countries before, but it's, it's pretty foreign when you're in a place where you go in and the women are immediately put in another room, you know, like that, that was a, a really uh, kind of wearing on, on my mind after a while. It was hard to do a lot of work because you're kind of just so aware of how different things um, were and not always for the best, you know, it wasn't always just like, hey, every, every culture is wonderful. There, you know, there are aspects of it which were, which were hard to be around when you come from a place that's totally different than that. Um, but on top of that, you know, just, just the, the bureaucracy is, is really crazy there. You know, I, I, I had a drone there. We don't know if that was even allowed. It was, you know, kind of a gray area. And that was because it was like, hey, if we even bring this up, we're not getting a drone in the country, you know. Um, but it was, it was small things too, you know, like, like you have a camera, you're used to having compressed air that allows you to, to clean your camera mirror and lenses. You actually can't buy compressed air in the country because it's used in bomb making. So things like that, that are just like, whoa, how am I supposed to do like really normal filmmaking things? Like that was a super challenge. And I think you mentioned this, but how did you hear about the project in Jordan? Um, so, uh, so it was really through my connections in, in graduate school, but Dr. Brizzi is the husband of um, my advisor in graduate school at Durham in the UK. And Durham is in the north of England. So um, it's way in the north of England, almost to the border of Scotland. It's a small little uh, city, but it has a tremendous archaeology program. And one of the heads of it, um, her name is Dr. Leone, and she's from Rome, and that's uh, Dr. Brizzi's her husband. And in my time in, in graduate school, you know, she advised me on my thesis about Fellini, and she became really interested in my work. I became really close with her um, and helped her edit books over the years and edit her English papers. And one time when I was in Rome with her, having dinner with her and Dr. Brizzi years ago, he said, "I'm, you know, I've been involved in this project in Jordan all these years, and I want to go back and." You know, they want media now and, and would you be interested and, and of course the answer is yes for sure but yeah that's 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 how it was all through the, the connections of, of my school and what advice would you give someone who wants to go into the film industry and wants to use the knowledge they've learned from their history and archaeology classes as a basis for their work but whose academics have focused on archaeology and not filmmaking with a master's degree in anthropology is film school needed in the next step um well the, what we always say to anyone, the advice who wants to go in the film industry is don't. That's what we always start with because it's crazy. Um, but in all seriousness, um, if you have, you know, my, my interest was on the anthropology side. In the UK, they, um, they, don't, they don't do anthro school like we do in America. So archaeology is kind of the, the closest that you do to anthro there, which is also why they're very open to me bringing this different kind of um, project for my thesis. So I think that Antho is a, a wonderful place to start with, with um, for documentary filmmaking. But the reality of, of film and filmmaking is that film school is, is not necessary at all. It's completely unnecessary. There's no, no one has ever hired me because I went to film school. Um, they've hired me because I have a track record in, in making films. That being said, yeah, is there, is there some bump you can get or some connections you can make or some skills you can gather? Like, absolutely but it's not by any means a requirement. Documentaries are really unique because they can be made for almost no money. The films you saw that I had on PBS, the first one I made about the Padres baseball team here, you know, I made that with no money. I was right out of film school. I made it almost all on my own. When I say no money, you know, like less than a couple thousand dollars over the course of several years, the work that went into it is, is, is me sitting there making it, editing it, working on it, constantly trying to make it better. You know, that's something that you don't need film school for, that you don't need, you know, anyone to tell you that you can do it. Nowadays, the tools you have to make a film are like incredible. They're just amazing. Even so different from 10 years ago. Anyone who's coming out of school now can make a film. And I think that if you want to learn to make films and you have a different background and you're not going to film school, it's totally fine. 
it's like any other industry, you know, meet people who do get, get involved with people who do you see talks like the one I'm giving you email people like me, like that's how you, you know, that's how you get involved in, in filmmaking. It's, it's a constant connections and meeting people and just seeing how can I learn something else. And, um, you know, I always tell people, I went to the best film school in the world. There's no, that's, that's unquestioned, but I always tell people, you don't have to go to film school to make films. Absolutely not. I had a wonderful experience in film school, but I was also an undergrad, you know, I, it was an undergrad program. I was going to get an undergrad education as well. I don't know that I would have done, you know, a, a master's program in, in filmmaking. You know, that's a lot, that can be a lot of money for someone. And, and for a degree that is, you know, of, of dubious um, importance when it comes to, to getting hired. I didn't get to write a screenplay because I have a degree in screenwriting. There's no, like, no, no one, no one's ever asked me for my diploma in screenwriting. <laughs> ever. I'm still waiting for that to happen. Do you think a dramatized feature film, something that's not a documentary, could also contribute to public archaeology, or do you think these two types of films serve entirely different purposes? Um, I think they, I think it definitely can contribute, you know, um, it makes me think of, I was at Sundance last year and there was a woman there talking about her feature film that she made called Luxor. And it was, a, it's a, it's a, like a romantic drama shot in Luxor because she happened to go to Luxor and be so amazed by what she saw there. And, and if you watch her film, it's not about archeology span but is it about a place where archaeology exists with the public? Like, yes, absolutely. Does that make people interested in it? Does it make people think about it? Does it make people, you know, want to explore it? Like, I think absolutely. So I think there's definitely value to, um, you know, fiction films being made within archaeological places or with archaeological themes. I think the danger is, you know, you get a you know, you get a, not just an Indiana Jones, but what's our last archaeological movie? Like probably like Sahara with uh, McConaughey, you know, like, is there any worse than that movie? Probably not um, as a film and for archaeology, you know, so, but no, I think there is some value on the, on the public archaeology side. We could do a lot more to explore how people who live with these places are experiencing them, you know, and, and art is a wonderful way to do that. That's, that's my feeling as an artist for sure. And for education purposes, is your project focused on adults or what age ranges? Um, it's supposed to, it's, it's intended to be accessible for, um, you know, teenagers and not really. It's intended to be accessible to anyone who can, you know, follow along kind of with the, the basic knowledge that we're presenting. As you see, you know, it doesn't, doesn't get too deep, doesn't get too in, in the weeds. Um, hopefully it's a gateway or a pathway for people to, to get, get on the website, um, which you can email me about, or just look it up. Um, you know, if you look up Temple of Artemis, Jerosh.org, which is the project website, you know, hopefully the video is a gateway to a place like that, which then tells you a lot and you can go as deep or, or, or not as you want. Um, but uh, no, we're, we're definitely trying to get as many people under the tent as possible. So do you have a website with your work or does each of these projects, uh, does the work kind of belong to each of these projects and they're separate sites? Yeah, I, I have a website with my work. I mean, you could, you could Google Chris Boyd, San Diego and probably find it in my portfolio. Um, but, you know, yeah, with a, with a project like this, you know, we kind of keep it really attached to the archaeological project because, you know, as Stephanie mentioned in the beginning, uh, you know, if you Google me, you might also find a, a feature film that I was a writer on. It's on HBO, which is as far from archaeology as possible. So, you know, I think one of the beauties of documentary filmmaking or, or what can be a beauty of documentary filmmaking, because oftentimes documentarians put themselves into their films, um, which I had no interest in doing, you know, it can, it can really be about the subject. It can really be about the topic. You know, and I think that's I'm more than happy for that to be the case here. You know, they need my background to raise money, fine. But in terms of, um, you know, it being about my work, it's, it's not about that. We get to present it on the more educational side of things, I think. Okay, I think we have time for just a few more questions. Um, someone said that there are reenactment shows put on for tourists at the site. They've heard about that. Is this the case and how does it impact the site for conservation and for public education? Yeah, um, you're probably talking specifically about the Hippodrome. Uh, 
which Dr. Breedsey like <laughs> thinks is pretty ridiculous. But there are there are some reenactors who get in chariots and, and go around the hippodrome. I'm preparing right now a video that's more in depth about the hippodrome, but um, that's probably been the most work has been done about that. It's it's like the real showpiece for people when they get there. Um, personally, you know, I think that it's it's definitely not helpful from the historical side. It's uh, you know, it's, they're usually wrong. It's not, you know, it's guys in costumes. It's, it's, you know, in a place like Jordan, it's guys who paid the right guy to let them in to do this. You know, that's how things work in this um, society. So, you know, from that side, probably not great. From the, from the conservation side, it's, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty non-destructive. I think the amazing thing about when you're in a place like this, like we worry a lot about like, oh no, there's a, there's a brick, but like, you know, this stuff, lasted a long time before and and it can last a long time you know to come um the guys in chariots aren't running into the the walls hopefully but um it's a little bit concerning i think there's some other things that go on there which are probably more concerning there's a music festival actually that happens at jerosh where they use the amphitheater uh, but now the amphitheater is mostly rebuilt and it's mostly non-original but still you know they, they'll pack hundreds of people into the seats to see a show in a Roman amphitheater. And that's not something that really goes on in Italy very much, you know, which is kind of no, the place best known for Roman ruins. Um, that's probably more destructive, those types of events. So yeah, it's definitely a balance to find like, yeah, how much should we interact with these places? How much should we, what, what should we do? You know, people used to climb on the pyramids until the seventies or whatever it was, and now they don't allow that. So there's, I think there's definitely some balances to find. And I know you mentioned that women are in separate rooms. Were there women on the site or were they under local rules and kept separate from the project? Yeah, so, um, you know, that it, it's kind of, that can be a family by family basis. So it's not like everywhere you go in Jerosh, every woman is separated from you. But um, where, where the site is concerned, you know, there's a huge difference between foreign women and Jordanian women. So you know, foreign women can really, it's a, it's a completely different um, scenario. Walk around uh, wherever they wherever they like, be uncovered, not a problem. Um, but within the, you know, the, the site itself, all women working there, yeah, it's definitely, you know, the local customs fully covered, as you saw the woman in the beginning of the video, um, taking lunch in separate rooms. Um, that's, yeah, that's, that's the case. But there are also um, female archaeologists there as well. And and that is a growing kind of movement. So it's been very heavily male dominated, but hopefully that's changing a little bit. But um, it is, it's, it's disheartening to know that things on that side have, have, have overall gone backwards a little bit from everyone I've talked to um, who's been out there a lot. And so hopefully that will change. But um, yeah, I, I, I am in no position to kind of predict the, the future of that. And what were your evening meals like? What kinds of food did you eat? And were you able to adapt to the diet? Well, uh, if, you, if you like hummus, it's the place to be. If you like falafel and hummus, if you like falafel every, every day, it's the place to be. Um, actually, the funny, the, the funny part was there was I haven't eaten meat in about five years. And uh, being invited to a dinner was the first time I had to eat meat to, to be polite. And that was pretty difficult because it's a very it's chicken and goat is like in every meal. So that was the, the challenge. But overall, I pretty much, because um, I didn't eat with families most of the time. So I pretty much just lived on falafel like every day, different varieties of, of hummus and falafel, which is great, which is really, <laughs> which is, which is, and sugar cane juice, of course. Sugar cane juice is awesome in all over the Middle East. You know, they just grind that sugar cane down and you just drink a cup of sugar and it's amazing. All right, and our last question for the night, what did you do to prepare yourself for this assignment? Um, you know, read a lot of the archeological material, a lot of the published work on the various excavations that have happened over the years. Dr. Breedsey provided me with a ton of literature. Um, I think that was a big, that was like kind of the, the biggest part to just prepare me for a lot of the history I would have to have some knowledge of. And, um, and then, uh, you know, I think the, the preparation that really came in all the other years before, you know, one aspect I left out of why I was um, 
ideal for this this project was I've you know, traveled a lot of countries on my own. I've been in a lot of what you would, you know, what used to be called third world countries and places that don't have the same infrastructure as we're used to. And so I was I was able to be just dropped in and and go. And I think that was a huge advantage. So just making myself familiar with what it was going to be like as much as possible and then being prepared to talk with people and as much as possible um, about the history of it. That was the, the most important part of the preparation for me. Well, once again, thank you so much, Chris, and thank you to everyone for attending tonight's living room lecture. Just as a reminder, please fill out that very short survey that's either going to pop up in your browser after you exit or will be in our year follow up email. That'll help us plan out the rest of our programming for the year. So thank you everyone for attending. Please check our website, sandiegoarchaeology.org for more information on our museum membership and upcoming events and have a good night. Thanks so much. Thank you, Chris. That was fantastic. Oh, good. All, all sound all right. <laughs> oh, yeah. And we yeah, had a yeah. whole handful of, of uh, comments of people saying they really enjoyed it and thank you and all of that. Oh, awesome. Well, I hope it was, I hope it was what, what you hoped for. So. <laughs> no, no, it was perfect. great. And the, video, the videos came through well um, as well. So I will make sure to send you the recording. Um, Oh, when I do all my fancy editing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it'll be just like this. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks so much. This is really, really easy and I appreciate it. So I can't believe it. I went as long as I did. So that was that was good. I tried to slow it down. So I think it's been all right. Wow, that's good. All right. Thanks, Everybody Chris. else who's still on, everyone have a good night. Um, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.